Thank you, Professor Ora. First of all, it is going to be difficult to, to, to defend uh, what grade I should be given. <laughs> but in any case, any grade for me is, uh, is useful because it tells me something. And uh, if it's a bad grade, I know I have to work harder. And if it's a good grade, still, it means I have to sustain it. So I learn from whichever grade I get. But first of all, I, I want to say our situation, Rwanda's case, is a, a very complex one. Uh, but is full of lessons. Uh, not only for, for Rwandans, maybe for the rest of the world, and specifically for, for Africa. It shows uh, what we are capable of in two ways. One, where we put ourselves, the tragedy of 94 the destruction that came with it. So it shows how human beings are capable of the worst things that they can also do for themselves. But 22 years down the road, it also shows what human beings are capable of coming from this background of a tragedy to a situation where not only comparison can be made between our situation with the normal situations, but also how, in fact, in some instances, Rwanda can provide examples to learn from across the world. If you look at the reforms you have carried out in many areas, Rwanda ranking in terms of doing business by global institutions among the top, competitiveness of our economy among the top, and consistently, and the growth of our economy that has been registered for the last 14 years between 7 and 8 percent every year. Women empowerment and participation in politics, in, in business, in decision making. 64 percent of our women representing the country in the parliament, 40 percent in the cabinet between 40 and 50 in the judiciary, in the local government, mayors, women, education. We talked about quality, which is very important, but I think there is quality to it as well. But if you look at the enrollment rates in for primary schools, secondary, and now into higher education, the figures speak for themselves. So normally in education, there are two problems. One, you have it's the quantity. It's how many people are you able to educate? But it's also the quality, indeed, too. Well, we have places uh, where both are a problem. And, and in fact, we started from a point where both were a problem. So we have tackled one impressively, and that is the enrollment rate. The other we are now working on and investing in is the quality of education. So the, the put together, still we are in a good place if you compare with the 
many other countries, who in fact, should be ahead of us, given where we have been and the situation we have had to manage. In health, universal coverage we have of our people, among the best you have in the world. Again, working on quality. It's not just about numbers, it's also about quality that has to accompany that. And that, again, is also registering a significant increase year in, year out. So, and let me touch something. I don't have to wait until maybe it comes by the way of questions. Uh, Rwanda landlocked. In fact, I had the roads being talked about. I don't know where it comes from that the roads are bad. Maybe it's just because somebody hasn't been to Rwanda. Or is talking about a story of 30 years ago. In fact, Rwanda has the best roads in our region. This is a fact. It's not uh, roads are things you see, so I'm not just creating uh, <laughs> anything. So in terms of infrastructure, the only thing we don't have is uh, a railway. But we are in the process of building a railway, and we are working with the region. We have a master plan for the whole region to build a railway connecting Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda, and Burundi. That is already underway. But for roads, there is no comparison between our roads and the rest of the countries in the region. Not only that, in other kinds of infrastructure, we have laid fiber optic cable across the country that serves every corner of the country. In fact, being rolled out to connect schools, administrative centers, or border posts, the ones that uh, the crossing points through which uh, imports and exports move or trade. We have laid close to 4,000 kilometers of fiber across the country. The city of Kigali are now rolling out to other parts of the country, to other towns we have 4G LTE working. In the area of telecoms, what we have registered also in terms of development is very significant. So the infrastructure that is there to serve the citizens and serve the private sector, especially for its fast growth that we want and we are noticing, is unquestionable. There's no doubt about that. But being a landlocked has helped us to think smarter and harder as to how we manage this. And two things come out. One is about regional integration that we have emphasized and is working, bringing together the five countries of 150 million people. It helps Rwanda to easily do business with these, or, and with, the, with these countries and within this market. The second we have targeted, again relating to competitiveness, is what are the things we should be doing or producing that have high value and therefore more or less render irrelevant, irrelevant the problem of being landlocked. In fact, that's why we have emphasized investments in technology, in services, in knowledge, because most of what you get from this is not that sensitive to how far you are from the ports that, through which you have to export some of the things. So there is that in mind uh, as to what we 
have to do, uh, and it's complex, there's no doubt, but uh, I think looking at uh, the continued growth, and growth, by the way, that translates into development of our citizens. It's not just growth, again, in terms of numbers, impressive numbers. It's growth that contributes to development of our people. We have, for example, <coughs> between 2006 and 2005, 6, 2014, registered that we have managed to lift people out of poverty to the tune of 1.6 million of our citizens. And these are numbers we have cross-checked with other institutions that we work with, whether it's the World Bank or other institutions. So the growth is not just growth of numbers, 8% uh, and, and that's it, irrespective of where it comes from. It is growth that actually comes from and feeds into uh, the well-being of our people. So in a nutshell, uh, we have done what is humanly possible in changing this situation. In fact, again, let me, let me make a clarification. Uh, even with aid, we have got, which has been very helpful. But we are not the only ones who get aid. There are many countries in the world that get aid. But how many make significant progress because they have been receiving aid? Therefore, you cannot qualify aid as being the one responsible for development or, or progress of people is also the people who receive it, how they put it to good use. So it, it, it cannot just be aid. <laughs> it, it has to be those who receive aid, how do they use it? And if they use it to build the kind of foundations on which they should be able to stand on their own for their future well-being and development. So MDGs that were talked about, I, I was actually co-chair of the MDGs commission from the beginning to the end uh, with the different other leaders. At one point, the prime minister of Spain, another, the prime minister of Australia, the last was the prime minister of Norway. Uh, I, I was throughout the years the, the co-chair of the MDG's commission. So from outside, there are things you get. But if you rely on, from, on what you get from the outside and don't do nothing from the inside, you are doomed. You won't get, make any progress. So MDG's were helpful as, as simply a framework and, and to guide us to things we need to do, but until you do those things, then you don't make any progress. So enough of defending my grades. <laughs> I think I would just simply welcome uh, any questions, and, and I'm always happy to uh, be here. Uh, I'm happy to be back. Uh, I always find the different faces, but uh, always a pleasure. Thank you very much. I'm curious what you, what's your vision for the future of Rwanda over the next 10, 20 years? Well, the vision for the future is not uh, divorced from the vision you have had. It's a continuation of the vision we have had. One, the vision you have had is really hinged on people, and their well-being, their development, and then the rest are those things that enable us to be where we want to be. But the aim is to be a stable, secure country and prosperous. And, and we know some of these things have been 
taken for granted by some other countries, but, but that's where I want to be. The, the aspirations are really the same for all people, whether it is Rwanda, Africa, or other parts of the world. So I had, I thought, I, I think we, we've been doing a lot, as I said earlier, to build the foundation, a very firm foundation on which we can keep building for the well-being of Rwandans, and, and for Rwanda in particular, we are very conscious and, and probably better than anybody or more than anybody as to how our number one asset is our people. So how we invest in our people for their health, for their education, for skills, for you know, they being the drivers of what they get and want in it for their future is, is the only way. So, 20 years down the road, I think we should be, maybe we, shall, we are about to obtain a middle income status, and that's what we are in the current vision running up to 2020, we are looking at. And more years ahead, why not move to another level like uh, we have seen other countries progress? <coughs> Michael? Uh, well, first, thank you very much for being here. Um, it's a great honor. We really appreciate it. Um, and Milka mentioned, uh, brought up the electricity point. I think it's a fair point that uh, you know you made great progress, went from 2% to 9% of population having electricity. But, you know, that's still 9%. And I was just curious how, how you were thinking about developing the <coughs> electric grid. It sounds like there's a lot of potential in geothermal. Uh, you do have some natural gas. Um, so, I guess intuitively, I think you probably uh, would want to invest in the electric grid in order to uh, foster uh, industry, um, any sort of production of propane energy. And I was just curious how you mm. thought about that. In fact, um, some numbers have probably been mixed up for, for the current connections for electricity are at 22%. And that is off and on grid connections. And we are looking at in the next two to three years, our aim is to have 70%. And that is possible because of the investments that are already underway. Now, initially the main source of our electricity is hydro. But we have already, in fact, underway right now. In fact, we have already, for example, 25 megawatts that has just been you know, generated from methane gas. Methane gas, methane gas to power is something that has taken a bit of time because of uh, the technology involved, but now it is proved that it's going to prove, it has proved already that it is working. And, and we have methane gas under Lake Kivu, it's a large amounts, it is 66 billion cubic meters, but at one point you have only to exploit not more than 3 billion cubic meters, which can give us at any one time about between seven, 700 and 800 uh, megawatts. And this is for a very long time, because the gas keeps regenerating itself. And so the, the, the complexity was about they have to remove the gases from under the lake, because it is mixed, methane gas mixed with other gases, and then filter out methane gas pure and return other gases to under the lake and then fire the methane gas and, and then turn turbines to produce electricity. So the experiment has worked. Now we can quickly uh, scale to whatever level that uh, will be allowed by the availability of resources. So we have that one. So in three years, you know, two to three years, we should be having uh, another, like, 
300, 400 megawatts, adding to what we have. And that's why it is easy to connect the 70% uh, of our population and probably more in a, between two and three years. So it's hydro, it's uh, geothermal, which can give us about 90 megawatts, and that is underway as well. And then um, uh, methane, and, and we are having solar. Uh, wind potential isn't uh, quite good in, in Rwanda for some reason. I think it depends on which parts, but solar is going up. I was wondering um, how your strategy kind of factored in the whole national identity building and how important that was in kind of changing a lot of the programs that you came up with, at least in Rwanda. Yes, that, that's a very good question. In fact, um, I, I should quickly say what has helped us with the, the tragedy we talked about, or which the case talks about and where we have come from, had its silver lining in a sense. It helped mobilize people because simply there is no, even with the different sections of our population that were affected or had been, you know, having problems of division and so on. After the tragedy, everyone took, you know, note that nobody benefited from it. Not a single family, not a single individual. Everybody lost, <laughs> whichever side it were from. So there was comparing need for people now to get together and say unity of our people working together is the way forward for, for all of us. So that has helped to mobilize you know, the people and Everybody is engaged, and that's why even some of the programs actually we carry out are easier to implement in our case than probably in many other cases that you may think of. There is that unit of purpose, is that understanding that we have a bad history, everybody suffered, and nobody doesn't want a good future. So good politics, mobilizing people to work together, good policies coming together, I think, have given us uh, what we are seeing as very good progress uh, and, and sustainable. Um, Helen? Yes. Uh, so I have a question about the Rwanda Youth Congress, and I was comparing the Rwanda Reserve with Senegal Reserve, and I was really impressed by the research in education where you uh, were able to have 29 university since uh, uh, from one in 1994. In Senegal, we have 10 university. We have a long tradition of education and very strong uh, support uh, on, on that sector. So the, the success is impressive. And I guess there is some, uh, some reason, underlying reason, very powerful underlying reason for that. And also, I, I thought that based on the, what is very specific to our Rwanda, uh, compared to us African country, we are both an Anglophone and a French country. I was wondering, do you see education as a sector in which you can um, you can become a, a hub of excellence for Africa, and uh, that on which you can uh, really be able to attract <coughs> students from all uh, African country and, and build uh, yes. growth based on the sector? Sure. Yes, thank you. I mean, that is already happening in a number of ways. In fact, uh, for example, Carnegie Mellon University has a campus in Rwanda, for, especially for master's uh, level education, mainly in computer science and, and so on. This is a program we we developed with them and got support from the African Development Bank when we asked them to support it. And the whole idea was, again, to deal with the quality of education. And also, much, it, it doesn't stop that 
our young people will continue to go abroad to study in very good universities that are there and so on. Certainly, we want that to happen, that continues to happen. But we also wanted to make sure that we avail this quality institution uh, as, as this one is, in fact, not only to serve Rwanda, but also to serve the region. In fact, the East African community region has endorsed it as a center of excellence where most of their uh, people will be coming to be educated and, and, and trained. So it's one of them. The other is uh, Rwanda is now hosting the African Institute of Mathematical Sciences. It has, in fact, it has been it has association with the Senegal again, as, as you rightly mentioned. In fact, there will be a conference with, in a couple of months, which I will be attending on that basis. So it's because of this. It used to be the center used to be in South Africa. Uh, it has now relocated to uh, Kigali to Rwanda. But it's in that quest to create good institutions of higher learning, uh, as well as feed it from the bottom. And uh, in the end, if this turns it into a hub, so be it, we'll be very happy. But our main focus is really make sure that our people, and together with other Africans who can also benefit from uh, what we are benefiting from, is what we, we want to create. <coughs> Are there um, any lessons that you think could be, that from the work that you've done that you think could apply to other African countries that are where you were in 2000? So are there any, one or two lessons and things that you did that really could be applied to other cases that are in the same position? Well, I, 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 I guess so, even before I think of any specific one, because uh, Rwanda, like other African countries, there are many similarities as, as much as there are some differences, but I think there are more similarities than differences. So, for example, it's, it's all about how you manage whether politics or economics. If you, for example, if there is fighting corruption, <laughs> which, which has bled our economies and destroyed some of them, uh, if, you, if the model we have applied of accountability from the bottom, the top or top to bottom, then other countries can, can do that. Why not? It's all political will. It's whether you've decided and are committed to doing it, and it will happen. So I'm sure there are lessons to learn, as we have learned lessons from other places. The things we are doing, some of them have been uh, experimental, but others we have right away picked from other places and applied them to our own situation, and, and, and things have worked. So if they can work for us from out elsewhere, then from Rwanda, things may work for others as well. Uh, sir? Um, to that point, um, you found it interesting that the Rwandan Development Board was modeled after Singapore, um, and also the goal of your Vision 2020 was to very much follow a trajectory where you become um, a knowledge-based economy by 2020. And so I was curious to get your thoughts on sort of um, how you chose to follow this development model, and what challenges you foresee in following this development trajectory, and where you might see the potential divergence. Right. Yeah, I have just said we've learned from other countries, from other people's experiences, and definitely we, we, we are very close to Singapore. We work very closely with them. In fact, they have participated in a number of uh, uh, things where they have helped us, given from. So what we do is like we go out and do some shopping. We go to countries and look at the things we like, and not only the things we like, but things that may work for us. And then we choose. So in our 
shopping process we liked what we saw in Singapore. And uh, so given the good relationship we had, uh, we, we learned a few things and worked together and some of the things shaped around that. And then, as again I said, for Rwanda, the f number one asset is our people. So and with the people, you just have to invest in education, in training, in their health. And then the rest, the infrastructure, the all kinds of other things just help to, to prepare whatever we want to do forward. Thank you. it? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> E-T-G-E-N. <laughs> yeah. I was looking at one of the exhibits uh, from our case, and of course it ends in 2009, but um, looking at FDI is being just north of 1% of GDP. Uh, the stalling growth of exports between 04 and 09, and also seeing that the commercial lending rates have none, not really gone down below 16%, there will be a perceived uh, sense that there's weakness in the private sector, especially uh, especially towards export-oriented growth. Mm. Um, how, how, how did your government and how did you actually manage to change that? It, it takes time. It has been happening over time. Uh, uh, private sector, like many other sectors uh, in our country, have also started from a very low base indeed. But we have benefited from more people being exposed. And, and now the private sector level of effectiveness in our economy has completely changed and has been growing over time. In fact, we have also been seeing more FDIs coming in. Uh, last year alone, we, for example, went up to 1.2 billion US dollars that came in uh, in that way. So from levels of, uh, you know, about half of that uh, earlier on. So it's, it's a question of uh, continued uh, exposure, training, and uh, we are seeing more people. In fact, fortunately also, uh, uh, a big part of the investments in our country is also domestic. We are seeing more, Rwanda is making the kinds of investments we need themselves from their own resources or from wherever they get them. Let me get the, the last question to make it count. Um, um, thank you. So uh, firstly, I think I would like to agree with you, President Kagabe, when you say that you and the Rwandans have done what is humanly possible given your context in 1994 to get to work out today. And as an African, I think I just want to say thank you for your contribution okay. to stability in Africa. Mm. My question arises from my concern at what I see as the growing um, inequality levels in Rwanda, where 56% of Rwandan wealth sits in the top 20 population of the country. Now, I think for any country, those levels are dangerous, and, but particularly I think more so for Rwanda, given where you've come from. And I come from a country in South Africa where we have the highest levels of inequality, and I've observed that, I've seen the social ramifications of it, where our inequality is divided along racial lines. So I'm just wondering what your strategy is with your government to ensure that the economic world that you continue to benefit from your um, actually do trickle down to the rest of the population, mm. but also, more importantly, that it is not based along tribal lines. Mm. Um, you know, because I think then that has the potential to actually undo all of the work that you have been done, that you've been doing. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I don't know what figures, the figures you are using are of when. But actually... Yeah, the 20... The studies that were that came out it was, was it the beginning of this year or in, end last year? It was towards, we are now in uh, February, so it was actually the, the end of 
No, it was in January. The statistics department, the working with the World Bank, with UNDP, actually show that inequality has been narrowing very fast. These are the latest figures we, f we have. But also to give you, uh, uh, and that's why I talked about growth actually feeding into uh, our development. When I talked about 1.6 million people that were, for example, got out of poverty between 2005, 6 and 2014, that shows you that, and, and <clears throat> let me, for me, the, 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 the other measure may be other than just the figures people talk about is when we look at the lowest level of our people, the poor people, and the majority of them, where they are, even if you just measured how fast they are getting out of that, forgetting about, for a moment, even those who have and have been moving faster, higher, but looking at those at the bottom, how fast they are getting out of there, I think that is a f gives a better feeling than just looking at this gap. So what we are seeing, therefore, is the majority of our people at the bottom. And the rate at which people are getting out of poverty tells us that our strategy is actually working. And, and therefore, if you look at the GDP per capita that has <coughs> more than quadrupled in, from 2000 to today. And this is real. It's not just a GDP per capita of some numbers. No, it's, it's real. <laughs> it means it has been trickling to the individual citizens. We, we see the difference being made down there. Now, the, the, the last part, which I want to rule out absolutely is whether the level at which people are getting better in their welfare and their well-being and incomes has nothing to do with the divide that has been there in our society. Absolutely not. That, that, there's no trace of that in our analysis, in our knowledge as we know of from one year to another as we have been moving forward. There hasn't been any trace of that. And we are conscious of that anyway, <laughs> so otherwise it wouldn't be making any difference. Well, um, sadly, we're running out of time, and I do want to leave five minutes to see if we can take a, a group photo. But let me really, really thank you, because I know you have a very busy life. Thank and you. The